Welcome back, my friends. Another episode of Market Watch Mondays. As always, I am your host at Mike Me Up with Two Ps on Twitter. That's again, Mike Me Up with Two Ps on Twitter. Go on there, holler at me, hit me up, talk football, talk whatever, talk NFTs, talk whatever you want to do. I'll be there and I'll try and respond. My DMs are always open, trying to answer questions from people um, about fantasy football or whatever it is. Uh, this week's episode is going to focus on the main focus of this week, and that's the combine. And I want to talk a little bit about the combine, not so much like the specifics of it. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff that that happened from it. I'll talk a little bit about my takeaways, but more so just like how I approach the combine, uh, how much value I put in it, how I use it as part of my process and how I believe you should use it as part of your process. But before we get to any of the details, man, by now, y'all know what time it is. Hit that intro. Mm-hmm. 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 All right. So exciting, exciting week. I call it the underwear Olympics. That's really what it is. A bunch of grown men running around in shorts, a bunch of other older grown men on Twitter obsessing over hand sizes, obsessing over jumps, verticals, how fast they run, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of attention that goes in the combine, probably way too much attention, but I don't mind because the combine is a great time, right? It's a great time. And I I talk about the combine as the first exit ramp. So if you think about all the rookie picks, you stored up uh, over the past year or two years, uh, whatever. Uh, there's a couple of different exit points for you to liquidate and realize and crystallize all the value that your rookie picks have gained. One of those is the first off ramp is the combine. And the second off ramp is the NFL draft. So those are the two key points. And this is the point in your draft uh, where you can try and explore trading away some of those future picks because there's a lot of hype on these players, right? There's a lot of hype on stuff that may or may not matter, most of which probably doesn't matter, uh, but we love to talk about it and because it's fun. I mean, I talk about it too because it's a great time. It's just, you know, we have a we have a lull between the Super Bowl and the Combine where there's really not much news at all, and the Combine comes, man. All these jacked, super, uh, super athletes, superhuman almost, go on the field in leotards and run around and, you know, for our amusement, right? And, you know, it's really, really fun. So I don't, I don't blame anyone for getting too into it, but from a process perspective and from how much you should put your weight and value into it, it's, it's definitely, there's, 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 I would say there's an imbalance between the amount of attention placed in the combine and the amount of rewards or returns that it actually provides you. And that's, that's really where my process comes into play. Uh, you know, a lot of people say like you hear it all the time, right? People, people on Twitter say like, Hey, you shouldn't care about the combine. The combine doesn't matter. Right. And then two weeks later, you know, after someone runs a four or three, that same person goes on Twitter and it's like, oh, this guy's now my wide receiver three. This guy's now my wide receiver five, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit tricky to kind of like, you know, uh, navigate through those waters on Twitter because, you know, people are saying one thing and doing another thing. Here's here's really my take on the combine. I think it's I think it's foolish to say that it doesn't matter. Right. Because it, it doesn't matter to an extent. Right. Like the combine doesn't matter to the extent that it shouldn't tell you what players are good or bad, right? Because those players have already shown you if they're good or bad. I think, you know, to go to, to leverage uh, a BDGE uh, family, Noah parties, he said it really well on Twitter. I think he said like, you know, when someone goes and runs really fast at the combine, um, that shouldn't really like deter you or, or, or like or, or make you even more hype on them. It's more of like an indicator that explains why they're so good. And maybe they win by speed. Maybe they win by agility. Maybe they win by certain things. But the combine really shouldn't reveal too much more new information that you didn't already know, especially when it comes to the wide receiver position. Running backs, I'll talk about a little bit later. But when it comes to the wide receiver position, like it, it matters to the extent that it informs you maybe like what types of things that those those players do well or or don't do well. But in terms of how good they are and how productive they are, you've already seen that in their production profile. And you know whether you use analytics, whether you use film, you should have already seen that leading up to the combine. But where I do think the combine does play a role, and I do think it matters, is it only matters to the extent that the NFL cares. And the NFL obviously cares about the combine, and it's reflected through draft capital, right? If you're a running back, especially if you're a running back, right? You know, NFL cares about, you know, how big you are, what size you are, how fast do you run? Even though those things might not necessarily be the most correlated success, they are very, very correlated to 
draft capital. Like, like I don't want to say correlated, but I say I want to say that the NFL cares about them. Why, why do hen- players like Henry Ruggs go in the first round, right? Because they're extremely fast. And for years and years, the NFL just loves speed, even though for years and years, there's more and more data points that show them Top end speed is not necessarily the thing that matters most at wide receiver. So I want to break it down in a couple buckets, right? Wide receivers and running backs and how I look at both. When it comes to wide receivers, it, the combine, it's like the athletic measurements, like really don't matter that much. I mean, you know, th- there's something that I do look at, which is the RAS score, uh, which is the relative athletic score. It's developed by Math Bomb on Twitter. If you guys don't know him, go and follow him. It basically creates an index uh, using the combine uh, to tell you how athletic a wide receiver is. So it talks about it has like speed, it has size, it has agility and all that stuff. And then it gets indexed from one to 10 to tell you who the hyper athletes are. So I will say like maybe on a scale of hyper athletes to end athletes, maybe it matters a little bit, but really from the, for the wide receiver position, combine testing matters very, very little. How you run, how fast you run in the 40 has very little correlation to how much success and how productive you are in the NFL. And that's, that's like, that is in the numbers. There's really not much to dispute that, right? That's why you have the Keenan Allens. That's why you have the Devonte Adams. That's why you have DeAndre Hopkins. That's why you have Michael Thomas. That's why you have all these wide receivers. And I think I saw uh, Adam Harstead like explain it really well is that if those wide receivers are, you know, are NFL caliber wide receivers and they are getting drafted high, right? Regardless of how fast they run, they are doing something else much better and much more usefully than running fast, right? Like a Devonte Adams, he's not going to burn you with long speed, but what does he kill you with? He kills you with his moves off the line of scrimmage. Keenan Allen isn't going to burn you in the 40. What's he going to do? He's going to run extremely, really crisp routes and just get open, right? Odell Beckham, same thing. Uh, although he's, I guess he's pretty athletic. And then DeAndre Hopkins, right? He's got mitts. He, he runs good routes. He's good in the air. He's got great contested catch ability. Like combine is not the be all end all of wide receivers. In fact, it's, it's like not, it's like not even a, a, a significant factor. We like to look at it because it's fun. And, you know, maybe on the super, super high echelon end, when you get to the Megatrons and the Julios and the DK Metcalfs, like maybe that informs you in how they win uh, and the abilities that they have um, to basically burn defenders down the field. But on the whole, if you look at the population as a whole, we grossly overvalue how much attention we pay to a wide receiver running fast or a wide receiver, you know, running a good three cone, et cetera, et cetera. Like some of the least athletic wide receivers in the NFL that tested poorly at the combine are some of the best wide receivers. And like, you know, even in the mid, even in the middle, like, like, like a player like T Higgins, right. Who was hyper productive in college. And then, you know, he bombed the combine. Everyone's like, all right, we're out on T Higgins now because, you know, he ran off, he ran a slow 440 and he tested poorly. He didn't jump high enough, but we already knew that he can win at a high level because he played at a top program. He played against the top competition and he was extremely productive even in the face of competition on his own team. So like I said, I just want to go back to that really, really good tweet from Noah parties and he, he just put it so well. It's like it, it, the, the combine is, is meant to inform you of how they win, not necessarily if they can win or lose. So to that end, you know, if we look at uh, wide receivers specifically, I barely move my ranks uh, for the combine when it comes to wide receivers. The only time I move it is typically down. Like if a wide receiver comes up and they run a 4-2 and they run a 4-3, whatever, like I really don't care with the exception of knowing that that might help inform draft capital, right? So, you know, when when Henry Ruggs went and, re- went and ran that fast, I knew he was going to get drafted. And getting that first round draft capital was a lot more important than whatever the combine showed. So similarly this year, like you look at some of the players, like first of all, everyone's running freaking fast this year. There's a lot of, lot of fast runners, a lot of four, three runners. People like, you know, four, two is lightning speed. Chris Olave ran a four, two. That was mind blowing to me. I did not think that he had that much juice. Uh, and then, you know, Garrett Wilson ran a sub four, four, uh, Traylon Burks ran a four, five, five or something like that. And people were like disappointed. And like, this guy is huge. This guy's like 220 plus pounds running 455. That's pretty good. Like, I think people set themselves up for disappointment because they're expecting like a DK Metcalf like every year, right? There aren't that many DK Metcalfs. There aren't that many Megatrons. There aren't that many Julio Jones. Like, they're not, they're, those are not very common to run at that size and be that fast. So to me, when he ran a 455, I was like, all right, 
Maybe he's a little bit slower than people thought, but that doesn't really change my view on him at all, especially when you look and we have in-game data points of him hitting like 20 to 21 miles per hour. So we know he has in-game speed. We see him breaking away from defenders. So we know he can do that in game. So for me, that didn't really in inform my decision at all for the wide receivers end. And if you look at how combine tests relative to uh, production, like in the NFL, which is ultimately what we care about, scoring points, there's like little to no correlation between how well a wide receiver does in the combine and how well they do in uh, the NFL, as long as they get the draft capital, right? So, and usually if you're like a high end player, right, and you go to a top program, you are highly productive, like, the combine isn't going to kill you. Like, like I said, for T Higgins, it didn't kill him for Keenan Allen. It didn't kill him, right? For Devonta Adams, it didn't kill him. Like these are already highly touted players, highly productive players coming out of college. Like DeAndre Hopkins, same thing. didn't kill him. Right. So, but where it does kill you is like, let's say you, you, let's say you, you really, really like, uh, like more of a fringe guy. And, and I have a great example of this for me in prior years. And it's Seth Williams, right? I, I was a big fan of Seth Williams, right? Same, same with Tyler Johnson. I was like, Hey, these guys are hyper productive, great production profiles, but like leading up to the draft, there's like no hype about them, right? There's no hype about them at all. Uh, and then, you know, they go to the combine and, you know, Tyler Johnson did like pretty much nothing. Uh, he didn't get invited to the senior bowl. So to me, it's like the combine helps me move players down because I'm like, this probably means they're not getting much draft capital. Right. And, and that's really how I apply the combine. If I, if I think about my approach to combine, I use it as, and I've used this term before, but I use it as a negative filter, right? There's very rarely, are you going to see me uh, move a player up because they ran really fast or tested really well the combine, right? With the exception of maybe some fringe guys that I think that might vault them into like draft capital. But those are, again, those are going to be fringe guys more in the low second to, to third round range. You're never going to see me move someone in the first round, some like a top five wide receiver that I had, I'm going to move them up just because they ran a fast 40, right? Because no, my, my decision as that wide receiver for that wide receiver has primarily been made up already by the time I get to the combine. So, but what I will do is move players down if they absolutely tank and those fringe guys, especially like Seth, like Seth Williams, like Tyler Johnson. If you look at my ranks in prior years, like leading up to the combine, leading up the draft, like they fell down my ranks quite a bit because it was an indication to me that like, they probably don't have much support at the NFL level to get significant draft capital in order to be relevant. And that's really how I think about the combine is like, if I, if I really, really like the player and they absolutely blow it, especially at the running back position, that's when I'll move them like way, way down my board. And I'll have an example of that. And for running backs, I think the combine plays a little bit of a bigger role because of the speed score and what the speed scores is uh you can check it out on player player profiler obviously matt and those guys put out fantastic work um at, at player profiler uh com combining all the combine metrics they show the bars you know if, you, if you're in fantasy if you checked out player profile you know what i'm talking about the bars you want to see those lean lean bars all the way across the top right and for running back specifically speed score uh does seem to matter because it takes into account two things right it takes into account how fast they run and you typically want some amount of speed to actually break away from NFL defenders, hit holes, and actually get out. So it makes sense for me for the running back position why that matters a little bit more than, you know, a finesse position like the wide receiver position. But then also takes into their size. So, you know, if you're a big guy and you run fast, i.e. a Jonathan Taylor, that's how you hit a 99th percentile speed score because he's coming in at like 220 pounds and still running a sub 4-4, right? And that's, that's how you get those like upper echelon athletes. Um, so if we look at this year, there were a lot of fast runners. I was not expecting all these guys to run this fast. And I don't know if it's because they changed. Uh, I heard that they changed the the guy who does the measuring of the times. Like the the difference between the official times and the unofficial times were like were like pretty massive this year. But we had a ton of guys come in at sub four four. We had Brees Hall. So Brees Hall, I think, really really cemented himself as a running back one because he was already really good. But then he ran much faster than at least I thought he could run. And he measured in a pretty pretty damn good size. He was like 215, ran a sub 4.4. Four. So those are really, really good numbers you want to look for. And that, to me, tells me that Brees Hall, I originally thought Brees Hall would be set day two uh, draft capital for sure. But I wasn't sure if he'd be like late day two or early day two. This tells me that he'll probably at least be, at the very minimum, be like early day two. So second round draft capital. So you can make a strong case for putting Brees Hall like kind of in that upper echelon with those top end wide receivers now. Uh, but then you have uh, Zamir White ran pretty fast. You also had uh, Kenneth Walker ran a sub 4-4. I think it was like 4-3-8 or something like that. He came in at like 4-4-6 and then got reduced to 4-3-8. If I don't 
if I recall correctly. So a lot of really fast guys, uh, and you had Rashad White, like, uh, and then even everyone else, like they were in that like four four to four five range. Those are all really really good numbers, especially given the size. Most of the guys are measured in at two ten to two twenty. Uh, so like I said, Rashad White's an interesting name to keep an eye on uh, because he also has the receiving upside, the receiving ability, and he's got the size. But the reason why I care about this stuff for running backs is ultimately you want someone that has workhorse profile someone that can go in and become a three down guy has receiving ability right has the size to handle uh three down workload and then has the speed and the ability to actually break away and earn chunk yardage right you don't want plotters and, and running backs is a place you'll see me drastically move people out of uh out of my ranks and specifically down like i said i use that as a negative filter where you know if i like the player going in and they go and they absolutely bomb the combine, I'm absolutely going to adjust my ranks for them because it it tells me that they're probably not going to get the draft capital that I hope that they're going to get. And for running backs, like draft capital is, I mean, for everyone, draft capital is everything. But for running backs, it just like matters like even more because that's really your only path to getting opportunity. And for running backs, if you get on the field, that's how you play, right? There's only there's only one running back on the field at, the, at a time for the most part. Whereas for wide receivers, you can get on the field and earn your targets and get open, right? So, in this class specifically, I'm not going to move any a lot of those guys up, you know, based on how fast they run. They're kind of just going to settle in where they're going to settle in. Uh, like Bruce Hall was already my running back one, so that just basically confirmed it. So I was like a that instead of like a moving him up, that was more like a punch punch the ticket. Like this guy checked that box. I don't have to worry about him not getting drafted anymore. Hopefully, uh, but like you know, the, the, the one of the guys that ran like the top speed, like I didn't know who he was before the draft. Not going to care who he is after the draft either. Um, it just. I might just like, he might be like a dart throw or something, just someone on the radar, but he's not going to jump into my ranks just because he ran a sub four, four, uh, and he ran the fastest running back time. That doesn't, so the fact that he beat out Brees Hall and, and, you know, you know, Kenneth Walker by like 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 seconds. Like I don't, I really don't care. So that's really how I think about the structure when it comes to applying, uh, what we see from the combine to the players. One player that really freaking set off some red flags though, was Kyron Williams. Uh, Kyron Williams, who I was like really a big fan of coming in. I thought, you know, he was a pretty damn good football player. He had receiving upside. Size was definitely a concern uh, coming in. So he's probably profiling more as like that third down back role. But I thought he had the ability to maybe like be part of a committee and win in that committee. But he put on an abysmal performance at the, at the running back position. Because, you know, if you can't be, if you're not big at running back, right, you at least want to be fast. And he was neither. So that's a big, big problem uh, because NFL, that's like two, that's a double dinger. That's two red flags, right? One, you're not fast. Two, you're not the size. So I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure where he's going to go in the NFL draft. So he's going to tumble down my ranks, like, dramatically, even though he was a pretty good producer, even though the film kind of checks out. Like, it just it's just not worth taking that risk. Uh, I would much rather, like, you know, if he falls in the draft, like I'll probably maybe snag him in like the third or, or, or fourth round if he goes undrafted and then, you know, see what happens from there. Kind of like, um, you know, kind of like a Kenneth Walker uh, who was a late round pick, late day, uh, day three pick. I think that's probably more of the path for him. So that was a big disappointment. That was like the one one player I was like, damn, I, I, I can't justify kind of holding this guy where I have in the ranks. It's, it's just too much risk. Like there's a there's a high chance that he doesn't go. I mean, I think it's probably it's probably already a lock that he does not go day two. Uh, I don't even, I'm not even sure if he'll go like early or, or mid day three anymore based on that performance. I'm hoping that maybe someone sees the film or whatever, but man, it, that was a, that was a major, major disappointment. And that's kind of how I use uh, the NFL draft. And it's, it might be a little bit cynical because you're like, Mike, like all you do is knock people down. You don't boost anyone up. And that's true, but like by me knocking someone down, like naturally someone else moves up. It's just that I'm not actively taking a player and saying, hey, you ran really fast in the combine. You're moving up to my ranks. If anything, it's just like maybe guys I had ahead of him really, really bombed everything, and especially at the running back position. That's that's where I, I look at that speed score and I'm like, fuck, like Kyron Williams, you came in measured in a sub 200 pounds. So you're definitely not going to be the workhorse profile and you ran really, really slow, right? So that that's just like a double ding for someone like that. I think um, the other interesting player was uh, I, I I'm so bad at saying his last name, but Tyler Tyler A from BYU. Uh, so he measured in pretty good. He's like two two twenty uh, or like 
215 to 220. So definitely hit the size profile of what you want in a running back. Ran a little bit slower, hit the 4.6. But 4.6 isn't like a death meal, right? A death meal is like you come in and you run a 4.7. If you, you come to the NFL combine and you pull in Elijah Holyfield, you're basically off my board because there's just like, it's just very rare to find anyone like that. And, and yeah, you might get that that one guy that like kind of breaks the mold and breaks the trend. But for the most part, you don't really want to mess with that too much, right? But this class at running back, like based on the combine, there might be a lot more draft capital invested in it than I expected. You know, guys like Rashad White, guys like uh, Brian Robinson from Alabama. He's like 220 something, ran a two, uh, ran like a four or five. Like a lot of these guys probably did a lot to boost their draft capital, which makes it interesting. There might be more day two guys uh, than, than I originally thought. And if that's the case, that makes this class a little bit more deep, a little bit more interesting, but at the top, it's a very, very clear, clear cutoff of Brees Hall by himself. So that is, uh, that was my main takeaway at the top of the class is the wide receivers didn't really move that much. Like, I think I might move Drake London to my wide receiver one, just because like the more I look at his actual production profile, the more I'm impressed by his production profile. But again, that's not really because of the combine or anything like that. Um, like Garrett Wilson went on there, did what he did. He ran like a four, uh, high four three, uh, four three eight or something like that, four three nine. And so there's really not going to be too much movement uh, on the wide receiver front, like I said, because it doesn't really matter at the wide receiver position. But for running backs, you're going to see Kyron Williams basically go pff, like way, way down my ranks, especially, especially before the NFL draft. If you're drafting for the NFL draft, there's just no reason to take that type of risk on a player uh, who may not get draft capital and uh, this required draft capital or any draft capital he might go freaking undrafted like that is that is what that what that's how catastrophic of a combine he had i think his his raz score was like 1.7 something like sub two which is just abysmal so this guy's like a fifth percentile uh like athlete with relative to you know the other athletes obviously relative to to me like he would run circles around me because you know you can't compare a red, random pleb like me to an actual you know, college athlete, uh, but relative to hit the field, it was a pretty, pretty abysmal day. All right. So those are the things I wanted to cover. Just a really, really quick process video on how to handle the NFL combine, which part of it matters, which part of it doesn't. Uh, but I don't want to suck away the fun, right? Like, you know, go, go ham, watch all the combine content, go watch the overlay 40 runs. I do all, I do all of that, but I do it more from an entertainment perspective versus a using it uh, at, as a part of my process and to evaluate dynasty rankings and evaluate my player's perspective, right? So that's that's the difference. It's like there's very few aspects of the NFL combine that really, really translate uh, to production on the field, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't have a little bit of fun. So just a little quick recap, make sure for wide receivers, really doesn't matter at all except for those that are kind of on the fringe um you know a lot of the high-end guys whether they ran fast or or ran slow as long as they're within a reasonable band it doesn't really have much an impact for running backs speed score does matter and if you tank your draft mainly because you tank your draft capital with it if you if you're an awful if you perform awfully in that field so for me use the nfl combine as more of a negative eliminator versus a positive booster so you'll really see me move stuff up up my ranks because someone ran really fast but you will see me move guys down my ranks especially at the running back position if they tank everything all right so that's all i got for you guys this week hopefully you guys enjoyed if you did make sure you hit the thumbs up button hit the subscribe hit the little bell as well so you can get notifications for other videos like this on market watch mondays or other ones put out by noah squared or the godfather himself nick you know max animal snacks whole bdg team we got you guys covered all off season long with the content pumping daily so uh make sure you guys are staying staying in tune with that all right um until next time that's all i got for you